Jeff on a Wednesday, and uh, I think he was amazed as well as I was how we just have – we're born on the same year. We're, we're same age, and, and I think we have the same love for God's Word, the same love for prayer, the same love for the body. And, and I'm just – I'm just uh, thankful, and I, I see our doctrine is very similar, and I love that. Um, but I'm just, uh, I want you to give a warm welcome to Clay. You don't want to use this, so. And I want to lift Clay up in prayer before he starts. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your presence, Lord. Lord, we know that this is you are the reason for the season, Lord. You are. That's not a cliche. That's just a fact. That's the facts, a biblical fact. And Lord, I pray for Clay as he brings this message today, Lord. Again, as I prayed up there stairs, that you would loose his tongue and allow him to speak your truth in your love, Lord, and speak it in a way that brings you glory and you honor. And Lord, just pray that you just help us to be ready to receive the message that you've laid on his heart. And Lord, just uh, we pray again for that one soul or two souls or how many souls are out here that don't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Word of God would convict, convict them to surrender all for you. So use clay as your vessel to, to glorify you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's green. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome. Merry Christmas and uh, all of that. So I'm going to be jumping around a little bit, but I've got some verses that I would recommend you put, if you have your Bible here, to put a marker in. So if you have a Bible, put a marker in on uh, Luke chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, and then um, Romans chapter 10. So we're going to go through a lot of verses, uh, but the, uh, if you do those verses, um, that'll help because we're going to do quite a few verses in those areas. So uh, put a marker in Luke chapter 2, uh, Matthew chapter 2, and Romans chapter 10. While you're doing that, I just have to share this with you. Um, when I got saved back in October, third week, third Thursday in October 1979, I had never once stepped into a church. I had never heard a sermon. I'd never been to any kind of Bible study, anything. And I went to a Bible study. I was the easiest convert on earth. At the end of the Bible study, I accepted Christ. So the first time I walked into church was the first time I'd ever seen a church and I was a Christian. I gotta tell you, the songs made no sense to me. But you know what happens after October and November? You get to December and they started singing Christmas music. I'm like, wait a minute, you mean this is about God? I gotta tell you, in, in 1980, my boss must have hated me because all I did was sing, Chris, or sing um, Christmas songs all year. I whistled them, I sang them. It's the only Christian songs I knew. So anyways, all right, so you got that story. Let's, let's pray so I can get started here. Father, Father, we do humbly come before you knowing that it's about you and it's your word and and it's for us to be able to listen to your word hear your word and let it pierce our hearts let the holy spirit use it in a way that affects us that we can draw closer to you that there would be nuggets that we would take along that there would be seeds that would be planted that could be you know germinated and grow in into long into the future and lord if there's anything you don't want me to say pull it out. If there's anything you want me to add, then put it in and bring it to remembrance because your Holy Spirit does that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I just, <clears throat> this is making lots of noise here. It, all right, there, there we go. Let's see if that'll work. Does that, can you hear me now? All right, sounds good. Okay, so in 1947, there was a young boy by the name of Muhammad the Wolf. And he was out herding goats in the Jordan. And he's walking around on the desert. I mean, what do, what do young boys do? They throw rocks. 
So he's out there pitching rocks and he sees a cave and he throws a rock in. And when he throws a rock in, he hears some pottery break. And that was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that, those Dead Sea Scrolls, that was the first of seven sites that they found scrolls. But the key point here is that we have the oldest copy of the book of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls, scrolls. and the copy that we got from the Dead Sea Scrolls was copied about 150 years B.C. So what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, the first one is... Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In addition to that, he also has, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's the God that we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, I got, I got to ask you this. This is written 700 years before Christ. 700 years before Christ, he prophesied this. Now, when I look at this, I go, you know, 700 years. Let's take that from here. Now, if God tarried 700 years. Could you tell me a name, an event, a place that something would happen? No. In fact, let's just go back to when that copy was made, about 150 years before Christ. Could you go 150 years out? Not even close. This is 100 and, or 350, uh, 349 other prophecies that were fulfilled through Christ. All of these prophecies showed that Christ is coming and all of his actions were there. This is not random. When Jesus came, it wasn't a random incident that just happened to happen. It's God's plan. It's God's direction. What did he say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe on him shall have everlasting life. God gave his son. And that's why we're here. We're here to see how God fulfills it. So let's turn to, um, we're going to start in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to go through quite a few verses. So <clears throat> just keep with me. So in verse 1 it says, And it came to pass in those days that the decree went out to, to Caesar Augusta that all the world should be registered Thus, the census, or, yeah, the census first took place in Quirinus, uh, was governing um, Syria. So all went to the, be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph, who also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who with, was with child. So it was that while they were there in the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room at the inn. So Mary and Joseph... They're coming out of Nazareth. They, you know, you don't travel in that state, right? When you're looking at a couple of days, a couple of weeks before delivery of a baby, you're not going to be traveling. But they had to. They had to go, and they were called to Bethlehem. You know, what's interesting is that was a prophecy. In Micah 5.2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, um, I mess that word up every time, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, Though you are a little, little among the thousands in Judea, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. You know, it's prophesied 700 years before that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. So we've got the census that brought him to Bethlehem. And then, what was he also? The lineage of David. And the lineage of David, we have out of 2 Samuel, 
it says that uh, when those when your days are fulfilled in your rest with your fathers, I will set up. This is talking about um, David's um, covenant and anointing. He says, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house of my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. The promise that Jesus is coming, the Son of God, that he is going to be here, and he is going to be the Savior of the world. So now let's look at back in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 now. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds lying out in the field, watching over the sheep by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and in glory of God shone about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Now this is, the, this is I mean, this is a witness. It is, I, I love these shepherds, because these shepherds, they're out there, they're doing the work, but God's, it doesn't say shepherd, it says shepherds. And what's interesting is an angel shows up. And when the angel shows up, they're like, okay, they get scared. And then this is be, be calm. It's going to be the witness. But, you know, they're going to have, there's more than one shepherd here. To have a promise or to have a legal witness, you have to have more than one witness. If I am only one witness, it's my word against yours. This is multiple shepherds. This is a legal witness. You know, when Jesus ascended, when he ascended, 500 people saw him ascended. 500 witnesses saw him ascend. And now the shepherds are the legal witness of the birth of Christ. Look at verse 11. And it says, if I can find it, here we go. <clears throat> For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And this is a supernatural scene. These guys are out in the middle of the desert. They've got their, you know, the, uh, the herd that they're shepherding. And an angel shows up and gives them, starts to give them the notice, get, tells them, hey, I know where you're going to find a proof. I'm going to show you proof. So when you get there, you can say, yeah, this is definitely it. And then the whole host of angels start singing. I mean, I... <laughs> This blows you away. I mean, this, this is not a, oh, I'm going to forget about this next week, right? This is a whole environment that is just completely um, open to them. And, and it's suddenly, I mean, it's not like one, two, three. No, it all appeared. And what were they doing? Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men, just blessing them. And now, when I... I, I, I want to bring up something that's a little bit different, and this might might intrigue you. Um, the shepherds that are there are nomads. Shepherds go from place to place, and they are definitely not high society folk, right? They are, you know, they're usually dirty. They're out there. They've been living out there. All that kind of stuff. That's shepherds. But there's a belief that these shepherds were actually Levitical shepherds. And what a Levitical shepherd was, was a shepherd that took the lambs when they were born, they would inspect them. And if they were good enough, they were clean, they were free of, of uh, any kind of blemish, they would wrap them in swaddling so that they would not get hurt or damaged or blemished. The idea is they were preparing, the Levitical shepherds were preparing lambs to be sacrificed in the temple. So they were taking care of the unblemished lambs. So they understood the concept. These are guys that are focused on 
preparing offerings for God. These are guys that focus on just you know, having that connection so that you know, we want to do it right. We want to give it everything we can and do it right. So the swaddling is the evidence that they give them. They tell them, hey, they're going to find the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling in the manger. Wrapped in swaddling. Why? Because it's the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the one that's wrapped in swaddling, and they're the ones that are coming to see what God has done and to see the proof text. So these are the two witness, or the multiple witnesses. Look at verse uh, 15 now. So it was when the angels had gone down from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see the things that has done or that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in the manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which they were told and um, told them concerning the child. And to all those that heard it, they marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. It was told to them. So here's the eyewitness, literal eyewitness. The angels told them, they go and you see Jesus. They see the, the manger, they see the, the swaddling clothes, and they understand that that swaddling clothes is meaning this is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God that's going to be sacrificed. Because in the Old Testament, there was sacrifice after sacrifice after. There was always temporary. It was always for a time. It was for a specific you know, year or whatever the situation was. But those were sacrifices that were just coverings. But Jesus came as the Lamb of God. He came so much so as the Lamb of God, even John the Baptist addressed him at the very beginning of his ministry as the Lamb of God. In John chapter uh, 1, verse 29, it says, And the next day John saw Jesus coming to um, toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then he continues down in verse 34. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The testimony of John the Baptist. And then finally again, again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The recognition that Jesus is is the Lamb of God that came to take away our sins, our way. But this is proof text. We've got a witness at the beginning, we've got the witnesses at the end, and we've got prophecies, tons of them, pointing to it. Proof texts. So now we're going to turn over to Matthew, and we're going to see another group that also are test testifying of Jesus. And in verse 1, it says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen the star in the east and have come to worship him. I think this is neat. There, you know, there's God giving direction. God showing God, you know, a lot of times we pray, it's like, come on, God, give us a direction. We don't know which way to go. We don't, these, these guys got it. God says, so, okay, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you a star. You're going to follow the star. You're going to figure it out. And they're seeking to do what? They're seeking to worship. They're seeking to come. You know, that's what we need to be. We need to be seeking that presence with God. We need to be seeking the time to worship and to, to praise Him and to fall on our face before God. And that's what He's looking for. And now, this isn't the same day. This is not, in fact, it's probably a year or longer after Jesus was born. 
because if you, well, we'll look at it in a second, but um, it's probably a couple of days or a couple of years after because Herod, when Herod put his decree out to try to get rid of him, what did he do? He said, two years and below. So that's why he was trying to catch, he figured in the time frame. Anyways, let's go to verse 3 now. <clears throat> and when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now this is interesting. I, I think of this troubled piece because Herod, you know, he's in king, and you now we've got the king of the Jews, we've got this, I'm going to lose control, I've got, there's, there's, there is definitely a concern because there's another power on the scene. And he doesn't know the response to it. He doesn't know how to act to it. And then continues, And when he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and inquired to them where the Christ was to be born, okay, so here we go. We've already identified them that Jesus, they're now saying Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Even though he hasn't done anything yet. He's just been born because of the prophecies that have been fulfilled. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you shall come a ruler who will be a shepherd um, a shepherd, my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. So he, okay, I got figured it out. Okay, we've got the prophecy here. When did it happen? You know, sometimes we get into this thing about knowing the little facts and the, uh, and the details, and we forget what it's really about. And here it is, oh, look out the facts. It's, this is when the prophecy happened. This is when Christ was born. This is the time. This is the location. He's got all the facts. But it's not applied to him. It's not, he's not accepting it. He just knows the stuff. Head knowledge. It's missing that 18-inch move to the heart. He's missing it. And then verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. Young child, because he's not a baby anymore. And when you have found him, bring him back, bring me back word that I may come and worship him also. Well, that's not really his plan. He, he wanted to get rid of him. He wanted to, you know, get, turn off the, uh, the ability there. But he, he lets them go on their search. And I love how they go. Verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which had, they had seen in the east went before them. You know, I'm going to stop right there. When the Jews were going through the desert, God had given them a pillar of fire. And at night, the pillar of fire gave them light. And in day it made a cloud that covered them from the heat while they were in the desert for 40 years. And when the cloud moved, or the column moved, they moved. But that's what God's doing here. God's moving this star exactly to put them in the right place. It's, you know, we, we look at God and we say, you know, we got a, a small God in our pocket because we think, oh, he can only do this, but he can't do this for me. This God does miracles. This God does fantastic things. And we just need to be receptive to him. So it will continue. In the, um, I don't know where I stopped. So when, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the, child, the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. You know, again... If you don't have the joy of the Lord, you need to get into the Word. You need to get into prayer. You need to get in, because it's not about the stuff that we do. It's the stuff that He does around us. And that's where we get our, our joy. Because, you, you know, I, I tell these people all the time, you know, I'm a guy, I've got my first child. I said, it's going to change your life. Because all the stuff that you did before that was about me. And then when you have a kid, it's like, wow, look what he did. He smiled. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It's the joy that comes as a father to their son. And because they didn't carry the baby, it's when they actually get the baby and look at it. And it's like, oh, okay, 
That's when that connection happens. Well, we should have that joy with God. He lives in us. He is our Savior. He, Holy Spirit, guides and leads our path. And if we can follow that and lead Him, or be led by Him, and listen to the Spirit, we will have that joy too. Not the circumstances. We're not carried about happiness. We're talking about joy in spite of the circumstances. Verse 11 now. Now this is uh, an interesting verse. It says, When they had come into the house, they saw the young child and Mary the mother and fell down and worshipped him. Now, every time you see angels, somebody trying to worship an angel, the first thing the angel says is, No, don't do that. I'm not God. Jesus accepted worship. Jesus desired worship. Even as a little one, they knew they needed to worship God. And then he continues, And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I know that we normally put this thing out there. It says there's three um, um, <clears throat> wise men. It, it's not three wise men. It doesn't say three anywhere. There are three gifts don't know how big the entourage was with the wise men that were going. But there are three gifts. The first one was, well, first they came and they worshipped. Once they got done worshipping, then they came and they started presenting him stuff. And they present him gold. Why? Because gold is signif of the king. You know, I, I, this, this is one of my happy verses that I always try to, um, it, it just blows me away. Um, in... Uh, I, I am I am a big fan of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is probably one of the most, most prophetic prophetic days to the specific day of Palm Sunday. And that Palm Sunday, the people started the announcement that Jesus was the Messiah to the public. Before that, Jesus always said, I'm, "It's not my time yet. It's not my time yet." Palm Sunday, it was his time. And what did they say? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, King of Israel. And that was the announcement of the Messiah. And they announced him as king. That's what the gold represents, the kingship, the kingship that Jesus has. The second one was frankincense. Frankincense is a, um, is, is a priesthood... Um, sense that they would use. Now, the priesthood of Jesus is one that we can spend other time on. Because there was the Levitical priesthood, and the Levitical priesthood was through um, the Levi's tribe. And they were people and men. But and you'll see that the anointing oil that will be used in the temple is not used for the anointing of those men. There, we've got, we're going to look at that in a second. But the key point was that Jesus was under the order or the priesthood of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was somebody that came along, shows up without a genealogy, without a ending, not knowing, you know, I mean, that's where he came from, is because he was of the priestly um, um, realm of God. And he was the one that Abraham paid tithes to because he recognized the position. Here Abraham's, you know, the father Abraham, but he's the one that paid tithes to Melchizedek. I'm not going to go into Melchizedek. That's a great study, but that's for a later date. So the third one was myrrh. Now myrrh, sorry, myrrh is a spice that is really strong. It's intense. And they used it for some perfumes and incense and that kind of stuff. But if you look at Exodus chapter um, 30, verse 31. Now, I'm going to read. I didn't put this on there. But um, in 24, it asked for the people to bring 500 shekels of liquid myrrh. So this priestly oil is being compared or being built using that myrrh. And it says, and, he and you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout the generations. 
it shall not be poured on man's flesh. Why? Because we're sinners. It's, nor shall it be made any other like it, according to its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. This priestly, priestly oil was used to anoint the brand new tabernacle and all the things that were in it. It was the holy oil. And what did it have in it? It had myrrh. So what's the significance of myrrh? Well, we're going to look at one more verse and then we'll come to that. In John chapter 19, verse 39, it says, And Nicodemus, who at the first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about a hundred pounds, to the burial of Jesus. It was a burial spice. It was a spice that they would use. I mean, it, that's why it's strong, to counter the other odors that come from a burial, right? But he brought that because myrrh is the significance of death. Myrrh is that sign that Jesus came king, priest, and born to die as a sacrifice for us. Because we are all sinners. And last week, we had a paper up here that had 612, uh, 613 laws on it. And you know what that proved to us? There ain't no way we can meet all those laws. We cannot be perfect. In James it says, you break one law, you're guilty of all. Right? Every last law. So we can see that the law came and showed us as sinners. We can see the Levitical shepherds create, getting the lambs ready for the temporary sacrifices. But then Jesus, the Lamb of God, came to be our ultimate sacrifice, to give us life eternal. Go to the last verse, which is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And I'll read it, and then we're going to talk a little bit. He says that, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... One believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are here celebrating the birth of our Messiah, our Christ, the one that came to do what? To die for us. He came with an obedience to the point where he is going to go all the way to the cross. So much so that when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's like, can you take this away from me? And he's sweating drips of blood because he knows what's going to happen. And God says no. And then he said, it's, fit, it's, it's done. I'm not going to complain anymore. And he goes through. And he follows through with the sacrifice and is sacrificed for our sins, taking away our sins. So, you know, the law showed our sin. Jesus came and he gave us a choice. That choice is do we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior for eternal life? Or do we reject him and say, you know what, the evidence don't matter. I don't care if there's 700 years before Christ prophecies. I don't care if there was witnesses at his birth. I don't care if there was witnesses that saw him ascend into heaven. I'm not going to believe it. But there's proof. Multiple proof. So your hope is in Christ or is your hope in the world? You know, it's a choice. If you've made that choice to accept Christ, you know what? Your name's written in the book of life. You've got eternity in front of you. You've got joy that's coming to your way. There's so much. But if you haven't, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make that choice. You know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. Right? You, we could not make it out of the parking lot. But, you know what is guaranteed? Eternal life 
can be guaranteed if you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your precious son because without him, we are most miserable. We don't have a way of salvation. The law will crush us. The law shows that we fall short every day. We can't do it on our own ability. But your grace sent your son, loving son. Not only did he come and born with all these prophecies and he follows all the things that you put before him, you also allowed him to go to the cross. And you put him on that cross. And what happened? You had to turn your back on Jesus. That turning back on Jesus was the separation of the love that binds the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was severed because he had our sins on him. And we can't, those sins can't have anything to do with the Father. So he was severed. And what did he cry out? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he felt that separation. That was the hardest part of all the sacrifice that was done on that cross. But right now is an opportunity for us to say, we want Jesus in our lives. If you haven't accepted Christ, everybody's heads down, everybody's praying. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand and say, I need to accept Christ. I need to have him as my Lord and Savior. I need him to be, take my sins, wash me, cleanse me, and make me a new servant, a new creature in you. For your glory, Lord, we come and we stand in your presence. We fall into your presence looking for you to minister to us as we go through this Christmas season celebrating the birth of our Savior. In Jesus' precious name, amen.